Thank you for the opportunity to be here. This is a great panel. Just to give you an idea again of the panel that we have, uh, Don Luke, he, he won the award for the best uh, top CPO dealer in the country. So it's a very high volume domestic store. So we get to get some insight from them. We also here, we have Todd, who's actually with Auction Direct USA, in, a large independent dealer group. How many used cars do you have on your, on your lots there at Auction Direct? We sell about seven or 8,000. Huge independent view there. We also have Larry Miller Group and Hendricks Group here. They represent dealerships from domestics to imports to Highlines, and they're spread out all over the country. So you're going to have a good mixture of some market share and what works for those guys. Uh, and I guess um, we'll continue to wait a little bit for Don. Or do you want? We're down. Okay. You guys go ahead and start. All right, no problem. He's in the building. He's Matter of fact, building. that's good. Um, well, I was going to ask him one of the first. But one of the top 10 best ideas for the certified pre owned, the top one is going to be, you know, selling CPO for the right reasons. And obviously, with all the stats that Isabel shared earlier, huge volume, CPO is growing, huge volume of uh, lease returns coming in to grow that opportunity for CPO. Uh, but you know, there's plenty of reasons why dealers maybe take advantage of the CPO program. So, Todd, I'd like to start with you. You know, what, uh, what is some of the reasons that you guys focus on the CPO? Well, there's one main reason, and that was because it's the right thing to do. That was the main reason we did it. We started with the NIADA CPO program about six months ago, and we uh, really started it because of the trends, right? And we needed, as a used car dealer, to try to you know, participate to the extent that we could in the program. And um, NIADA came up with a, a fantastic program that allows us to be able to compete. Ladies and gentlemen, our CPO Dealer of the Year, Don Luke. I was talking to a cute gal, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to throw you to the wolves and ask you a question as soon as you walk up. Um, yeah. Don, thank you for joining us. One of the top 10 best ideas is, you know, selling CPO for the right reason. Obviously, you being a high volume CPO dealer, domestic, uh, what are some of the reasons or maybe main reasons why you participate in the CPO program and, and how does it help your store? Uh, for us, CPOV is, a, uh, is another be reason to buy a car from Bill Luke. We are a uh, price item retailer. Um, we try and be the cheapest uh, of all uh, the makes and models. So when we go to an auction and buy cars, uh, we look at it as what, what can I sell this car for, not how much money can I make on it. Yeah. And then we bring it back and wrap it with a CPOV. So to me, it's, a, it's another reason to buy a car from us. Yes, we spend the $400, yes, we do the 125 point inspection, um, but it's it's an advertising tool. Uh, we don't look at it as a way to make more money. Now keep in mind, we run a velocity program. We do not run an average used car operation. We do 500, 550 used cars a month. We've done as many as 584, and I think we did 310 uh, new. So we were up in the 800s. Um, I think CPOV for a, for a lower volume dealer can be used as an additional, you know, to make more incentive. Mm -hmm. uh, but to us, it's uh, it's an advertising item. It's a uh, it's a draw. A draw. You know, one of the interesting things is my warranty penetration <laughs> is higher on CPOVs um, than it is on non-CPOVs. And I have to tell you, years ago, when we were doing about 200 used cars, we were CPOVing about 60, 50. Then we moved into about 350 used cars. And they thought, well, we want to do a lot more CPOVs. And I was scared to death it would kill my warranty yeah, penetration. Yeah. So I have to tell you, I stared at that about as hard as you can stare at it and uh, proved myself wrong again. Um, actually, the penetration <laughs> was better. So that would be one other reason why I like CPOVs. Yeah. 
You know, I was surprised by that stat too. I attended the uh, CarMark, which is another third party that provides certified programs to dealers, and they said the same stat. There was an increase in that warranty penetration. I was, I was kind of thrown off by that, but it's good to hear that you guys have the same luck with that. But uh, The second uh, best idea is you know, obviously training your sales staff. And I think this is a good question for David and Rob because you guys obviously have a broad brand of sales staff out there spread out. Uh, what's some of the best training that you guys do to help your, your salespeople promote the CPO program? Because obviously sometimes there's a, obviously a premium on that and you got to translate that to the customer. So what are the best things that you guys do to train your staff? Well, in training your staff, let's let's face it, that's that's absolutely critical because that's where the customer interface is. Mm -hmm. That's when if they can't sell the value proposition of a CPO, you're not going to get paid back for your investment. So um, the hardest thing to do is to get salespeople, believe it or not, to sell value. And so selling the value of the program, getting the ROs, letting them look at what was done to the car, having them take pride in the quality walking the lot, actually doing those good old fashioned things like trade walks, look at it before and then look at it after when we're finished with it. And it's a, it's a vehicle and a product that you can be proud of, but you're gonna have to be able to sell it to make the money. Yeah. So we intensively train on the value propositions of each CPO program that we have. How much do you lean on the OEMs to help with that training? We, quite a bit actually, yeah. quite a bit. And you, right? Uh, we're the same. We rely on the manufacturer, the OEMs, uh, a lot to do the training within the stores. I think everybody faces the same problem uh, within their dealership is hiring competent people to sell cars. Um, so, you know, the CPO program we use um, as a switch piece when we get customers in on a new car and, and they can't quite get to the payment, we make sure we stock some CPO units that are thirty, forty, sixty dollars a month less in payment to the consumer. You know, this is, oh, I, I think the interesting thing is actually the independents uh, have taught us a lot about selling CPO. Um, they had to develop their own programs to compete with that, and yeah. therefore they developed the expertise of selling against CPO, which really made them selling, you know, better, better at selling CPO, period. Yeah. And so they have really done a good job of driving us to do a better job at selling the certification program. Now this ain't on here, but I think it has a lot to do with training and in the, in the, in the independence of the fact that they don't have the transition from a new customer yeah. switching them to you, so they obviously have to have that success there. So how, you know, how do your salespeople train that? Because not only that, you got the pressure of the OEM to hit those new car volumes. You know, what percentage or is there a certain goal that you guys have in mind to transition some of those customers from a new to a CPO? Is there any kind of stats or anything you guys change on that or try to for us, encourage or decourage? For us, that varies by manufacturer. Okay. Um, you know, different manufacturers obviously have uh, much greater penetration in the CPO. Uh, we see Toyota stores that are 50, 60 percent CPO. Um, but as a general rule, we'd like to see 30 percent of the, of the cars be CPO. Okay. That leads us into the next question, our best uh, CPO idea, and I'm going to turn it into a question, but manage the right mix of certified. Um, you know, I think, Don, with you with the high volume, I want to ask you that question. But also one of these gentlemen here, uh, well, actually with the independent, Todd, this would be another good question for you as an independent dealer uh, with the opportunities to certify a different mix of cars too. What percentage do you guys send it? So I'll start with you, Don, as far as what's that right mix? What percentage of your inventory is CPO? We certify every single Chrysler product we can, period. We do not use the secondary program uh, that is available for certifying off makes because that gives them a 12 month wrap. I should explain Chrysler certified is a three month wrap. So it's not bumper to bumper, but it's very inclusive. We try not to say bumper to bumper. That really gets you in trouble in the used car business. <laughs> but. Uh, um, their, their program for off makes is a 12 month wrap and that would kill my new, my uh, finance business on the warranty side. So uh, we do not do the off makes and I am talking to the manufacturer diligently about a three month or wrap for the off brands so that we can go ahead and wrap all those two. To us, an extended warranty is a $1,000 profit item. 
Oftentimes, we sell new cars and used cars at a loss and get it all back in the finance department. So I just share that with you. When you get into a velocity program and you're going to turn as much iron as we do, um, if the government ever killed our back end, <laughs> I wouldn't be here. Uh, I'd probably go out of business real quick. Yeah. But uh, to us, um, new and used cars have unfortunately become a, a commodity. Um, and it's, uh, it's all about uh, being able to finance the car and sell the extended warranty, et cetera, gap, tire, and wheel. Okay. So long story short, I certify every Chrysler product I can. Well, Todd, before you answer, back to you, um, Don, is you know, we, when I've trained dealerships, we run a, encourage them to run about 50% of their franchise and used car inventory. So if you're a Chrysler, Ford store, carry about 50% of your inventory as Ford and the rest do the mix. And I might be putting you on the spot, but what percentage of your inventory is Chrysler Dodge Jeep products? And then of that, what percentage would you say is certified? And maybe I put you on the spot with that. But yeah, you did. You, I apologize. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Appreciate that ah. question. <laughs> Truthfully, that uh, that can rely on the market. Um, okay. I, I'll give you an example. Um, the the boys were uh, at the market and they ran a whole bunch of uh, Hyundai's, mm. and uh, you know the truck started delivering cars, and I thought I was a Hyundai dealer <laughs> because the price was right. Yeah. And I believe it was the Sonatas. They had dumped a bunch of them. And um, we were buying those um, and able to retail them at $10,000. So they bought, I don't know, 45, 50 of them. I turn around and the whole place is full of them. <laughs> so at that point in time, we were uh, probably 25% uh, you know, Chrysler yeah. and, and other. Yeah. So I think it's really depends on which way the market's going, who's sure. dumping what. Um, and where we think uh, we can turn a car. They, you know, certain cars are price sensitive. Mm -hmm. Anything you can buy and sell in a $10,000 price range will buy. sell. Um, anybody can sell those. Sure. So uh, sometimes okay. I think it just depends on the pricing at the auction. Sure. I would say that typically better than half my inventory would be Chrysler products. Right. But uh, we buy a lot from the rental car companies, and that would uh, that would lower that number a little. Okay. So, Todd, how about you with the independent? What what kind of mix do you have with your certified? Yeah, that's a great question for us. Um, and I, I, I agree with Don. A lot of it has to do with your market, because we've got we've got a store in New York that operates entirely different than the yeah. store that we've got in Raleigh, North Carolina, and entirely different than the one that we have in Jacksonville. Um, but we've got a lot of flexibility with the, um, with the program, with the NIADA CPO program, because they go back 14 years on, on a car and 150,000 miles at the time of sale. So I've got a lot more flexibility with respect to my selection. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we are obviously unique with respect to that, uh, so we don't really have any competition. Uh, that being said, is six months ago we started the, the program and we um, stocked because we were, you know, in that euphoric state. This is a brand new program. We're going to stock probably 35, 40 percent of the cars, which was a big risk for us as well. Um, and we sold 35, 40 percent. And now I think we're probably in like the 25 percent range, and we're selling 25 percent. So, um, you know, the uh, but the the so we're still experimenting, okay. but it's it's consumer driven. So it's. Um, you know, we're going to stock as we learn more about it. Uh, the right level is going to be determined by the demand in the market. Yeah. Now, I know you say it's consumer driven, and then I don't know if this would be a, a good chance to maybe bring up your video because I know you have a commercial to educate the consumer on your program and stuff. And I don't know, do we have that video available to run? All right, let's cool. take a look at that video of this is a commercial that they run to educate the consumer uh, on their yeah, program. That the program exists. Auction Direct USA, where you always get the market's best price, now offers NIADA certified pre-owned vehicles. Get peace of mind with a 125-point inspection and six-month, 6,000-mile limited warranty. Plus, get the exclusive Auction Direct USA Advantage, Carfax certified accident-free, free vehicle maintenance, state re-inspection, and 100-day, 1,000-mile return option. Make your next used vehicle a certified pre-owned vehicle from Auction Direct USA. 
Come see us today or learn more at AuctionDirectUSA.com. And I think that's a strong commercial because what Elizabeth talked about er earlier, um, the fact that the used car consumer didn't seem that edu or educated or, or aware of the CPO program. So I think how, mu how much does that help educate your buyers with the store? The, the TV the, the, Yeah. Um, you really got to get a lot of uh, impressions to make a difference yeah. in a market in the yeah. size that we're at. Yeah. So I think it introduces the concept, but more importantly, uh, we, we do from a presentation standpoint, when the guest comes into our store, we immediately inform them about how we do business and um, immediately inform them about the benefits of a CPO vehicle. So it's more of a, right now, it's more of an in-store education. And that's one of our biggest challenges as the independent, which I think would be a segue to one of the other comments yeah, I in think there, the next one, yeah. is that you've got very few opportunities to market online, and we, like you, are low price, you know, uh, low price in the market. So we spend probably 85% of our marketing digitally. So it's really important for us to have that, you know, first page presence, second page presence. And if you're competing on a CPO basis against non CPO cars, you're not going to be on page one, page two, you're going to be somewhere, you know, behind, mm -hmm. uh, unless you can uh, compare yourselves to uh, other CPO vehicles. And only right now, eBay gives us that opportunity, and I think Car Carfax either does now or will soon give mm -hmm. us that opportunity. Okay. Great. And now that did roll into the number four uh, top ten ideas to consider a superstore model. You know, turning that inventory, but. Like I said, the independents have the opportunity to sell CPO, and I know you you mentioned that earlier, David, that the fact that these independents, you know, kind of can crush, start biting into your market share there. What kind of things maybe, are you guys doing anything different to try to offset that or, or deal with that, educate your salespeople and what, what to overcome with those things, or is there anything different that you handle? Well, we want to make our sales teams obviously experts in our CPO program. Uh, we've also developed our own uh, uh, CPO program as well for off-brand models mm -hmm. so that we can virtually certify everything uh, in one way or another. Okay. And so, uh, but I will also say it does depend on the market. It depends on the manufacturer brand. And we have markets where we certify every single car. And I think that's, A, we want to be known as a quality dealership, but B, I think it's easier. And we've taken almost the path of least resistance to make sure that our sales teams know yeah. that every car out there is, is certified. Uh, but I would say, and this is probably not the right forum, is, is one of our problems is knowing when not to certify. So <laughs> I'll, I'll look for the lightning bolt. No, but tough. one yeah. of our challenges is we, we pay full retail rates for, yeah. for reconditioning. Yeah. And so that's, that's our strategy is, is it's, it's, on, it's on the back end. And, and I agree with Don. I think the interesting thing is looking at front end gross sometimes sometimes creates perverse incentives, right? So uh, nobody ever complains when a car runs through the system and makes a nice front end gross but doesn't make a back end. Mm -hmm. But it is really interesting how when a car goes through the system and doesn't make a front end, or, or, makes a, or, or we make a big back end, but then they mm -hmm. want to complain about not having the front end. Yeah. And it's the same amount of money, and I think it's really interesting that, that we need to get better at measuring the value of a VIN Yes. going through the system and understanding the value that that represents. Yes. So, um, so I think it's, it's, it's in some markets we, we do CPO for everything and in some markets we're a little bit more judicious about that. So. And we'll touch a little bit on the gross thing, but the, first, the next one is getting your pricing right. Now, I do want to ask Rod this, but I also want to throw it back at Don too, because Rod, give us perspective of getting your price right across all different domestic, import, luxury, and then Don, you know, obviously with the high volume of velocity, what, what do we got? Because I was really thrown off, uh, Don and I got to talk to Isabel afterwards, when she said that the millennials are willing to pay a two grand premium for a certified program, and we don't see that at all when I deal with domestic stores. Specific, I, I think an Infinity or Lexus might be able to ask a little bit, a, a couple grand or two more premium for the certified car over another one, but Ford, Chrysler, domestic type stores are really tough to be able to ask a premium. It's just, to me, there, a lot of these cars are budget cars, and if it don't fit in their budget, they're not willing to pay up for it. So big struggles that I deal with, and I'm, uh, that's why I want to point to you guys, you deal with those same struggles, and what do you do to overcome them when you come to pricing these cars? 
we deal with that with every car with every car we sell. So we come to the realization that you know price isn't the only thing that sells a car. Obviously, you've got to be valid in the price. You've got to be relevant in the price. But what we find more and more are quality comments, quality photos, really sell cars. They get people's eyes on the car. Uh, and again, price, you've got to be valid. Our uh, uh, digital director has a sign on his uh, wall in his office that says, where's the best place to hide a dead body? Page two of a search page. <laughs> so you've got to be relevant with price, but you've got to tell the story with the car. That's good. Don, how about you with your pricing at, the, at your store and the volume that you guys do? And you, you mentioned it earlier about pricing those at a very competitive price. And uh, how much at or below a comparable non-certified AU runner? You know, we don't really even look at it that way. Okay. Um, I don't know. Maybe we're just strange. Um, like I said before, uh, my used car manager and my buyers uh, look at an automobile uh, for what they can sell it for, not what they can buy it for. Where does that car fit in the market? Am I going to be on the first page? Am I going to be one or two top selection there price-wise? Yeah. And then if there's room for us to recon it, CPO via it, great, get it and get it in. Um, you know, we were talking earlier um, this market uh, fluctuates, you know, all of us right now are probably out buying a ton of cars. I know that we'll buy probably 350, 400 cars more than our rate of travel because this is the time to buy used cars. Um, matter of fact, I have, a, I have a stack of paperwork on my desk to sign for more flooring because <laughs> we're at, uh, you know, it's fun to be a volume dealer. It's $43 million worth of flooring between new and used. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> if I had that kind of money, I wouldn't be working. Um, but uh, um, for us, it's being, in the, being at the right price, offering the CPOV on the Chrysler product, um, being able to recon that car, and, and we're really strong on the recon. You do the 125 inspection, but we want that car dead right. We don't want to see that customer after he buys the car. Because okay? mm -hmm. when they come back with one problem, they manufacture three more. So we try and make sure that does not happen. We work on that real hard. Um, photos, huge. You know, we do, I don't know, we do 40 some odd pictures. I think they take pictures of pictures at times. But, <laughs> uh, um, and we even do our, in, our own new car inventory. We do not use stock photos. Mm -hmm. uh, every car we take pictures of. Um, it's just... Turn them, turn them, turn them. Yeah. It, it, you know, we're just a little strange that way. It's um, good, good. It's working for you, though, right? Well, it work. It works for us, uh, and we do make money on on cars that we sell. We don't have to always finance them, but we yeah. oftentimes, I I get a break out of what we sell every day. I'm sure everybody here does, and uh, you know, my average gross profit some days on new cars will be $164, and that counts back end. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's, it's a volume thing. And I've seen it to where my used cars average $432. But that was also three months ago when the market um, kind of dipped on us and caught us with uh, 562 cars that we were a little too proud of. So we just rolled them, got them out of there, bought fresh and kept going. So. Uh, yeah. Well, that leads into the uh, knowing your gross, so CPO over non. And uh, again, I was listening there in the car mark uh, workshop, and they had mentioned Honda, and it's, I think it was a number of thirty dollars higher in CPO gross than non-certified. And I guess I'll throw this to David and to get uh, Todd your input on independence. One, do you track it, which you probably do. Two is then what is that average? Is it higher? Is it lower? Uh, I, I guess across the board for your group, and then again, Todd for your independence. Uh, but yeah. um, we do track it. Mm -hmm. It's a very important stat. And it does reflect what you were saying earlier. In our domestic, we're, we're a third domestic, a third import, and a third luxury. And uh, it's interesting how the more expensive the CPO program is, the better we get paid for it. Mm -hmm. And so as a general rule, from the domestics, it's, it's less of a, of a difference between the gross, reflecting what you've observed. 
and then all the way to our BMW stores where we make a significant amount more for, for, for CPO, obviously. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's one of the manufacturers where we, we do try to certify everything that we, that we come across because it's profitable. Yeah, so I guess it goes into the cost of ownership of the CPO and the selling price of the, uh, that you can actually transact at. Right. Across the board, you would say you're more profitable on the CPO, because that's a lot of the struggles that I talk to a lot, especially in domestic stores, is like, man, by the time I buy the car, CPO it, put it through, spend the money, and then price it for what I can sell it for, there's not much meat on the bone, but are you finding that, I, I guess I'm asking, uh, domestic, are you okay? Are you making more CPO? We are making slightly more okay. on CPO. And then, and then it's a little bit higher as you go up. Okay. And then again, I would, I would just say, tracking the entire value of the VIN, it's leaving behind a significant yeah, we'll mention, yeah, amount we'll more in, on the back end, so. Good deal. Now, Todd, with you, do you find the same thing? And I don't know if you get that deep into your tracking the CPO gross, but do you find it on the cheaper cars or the luxury? And when you sell a used Lexus with your certified program, are you able to hold a little bit more than you would maybe your uh, Fords? You, you would think that would make sense. Yeah. Um, but we don't really, and, and shame on me, but I don't track that on a per model basis. Yeah. But we do track, obviously, the CPOs versus the non-CPO performance. And I can say just um, you know, generally speaking, because we are, you know, as challenged from a marketing perspective uh, on the lowest price, we probably on the front end don't make any more money on a CPO than we do on a non-CPO vehicle. Uh, where we do have some success is on the back end, and we talked about warranty penetration. We're seeing increased warranty penetration on a CPO vehicles. I don't know if it's a training issue that they're just, you know, they're in, they're in uh, sell mode, or if that's a consumer, uh, again, a consumer demand. But the, the, the part that's really exciting for us is a turn. I mean, our, our, the CPOs sell quicker than the non-CPOs, and, and it really is a matter of having a, uh, a CPO Impala next to a non-CPO Impala. The CPO Impala is gonna sell, uh, is gonna sell quicker, and it's, it's really not that much more expensive because mm -hmm. it doesn't cost us that much more to recondition a CPO because we have a very high standard to begin with. Uh, but they'll choose, you know, 30, 40 percent of the time that that CPO uh, Impala. Okay. But the so, turn, because we do have a limited number of spots on our lot, so the turn to me is particularly important. If I can turn a spot two times in a month yeah. instead of one time in a month, and sure. I've made twice the amount of money, so I guess if you do the math, you know, overall it is it is pretty powerful. Yeah. Now, David, I'm going to point it to you just because we talked about it earlier. You keep bringing up the fact of tracking the VIN number and, and seeing other aspects of that gross other than just the front end. I had a Chrysler dealer who's in a small town talking to me and saying that he you know, almost wanted to back out of the CPO because it's costing him so much. And in a small town, he can't make it up in volume. Uh, but one of the questions I asked him was, well, what about those trades? Uh, you know, I'm assuming you, know, you get these late model CPO cars, you're going to get some decent trades. You're going to get those trades that's hard to buy at the auction, that if you were to track that and add that to your gross bottom line, I think there is a benefit other than just looking at your front end. And, and again, is that something you guys track or do you guys get granular and any other? Uh, I, I wish we did because that, that adds to the equation. But um, we did do a little pilot this past fall where we redistributed inventory in our luxury group and it was about 100 cars that we took and we moved. And the interesting thing is we did track all the way down to whether we got trade-ins. Now we would have lost, if we would have wholesaled those cars, probably close to $3 million. Hmm. Moving them around, we managed to keep the loss, I'm sorry, 300,000. And we would have lost somewhere around, uh, 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 we only lost 100,000 through the transfer. We sold 80% of those cars at their new location and broke even on the front, made money on the back, and out of those 100 cars, we took in 30 trade-ins. Nice. And it's interesting how guys are much more willing to, to shoot it in the head at the wholesale, in the wholesale market, yep. rather than break even on the front end. It is, it is a perverse incentive that, that really has to be you know, uh, uh, educated away from them because they really focus so much on front-end growth yep. And to your point, there's so many things that add value to the dealership as you move through, and trade-ins are part of that. Yeah, yeah. So, and these were Highline trade-ins, which meant that they were probably retailable pieces. I didn't track it that far, yeah. but uh, that would be the next step, is to find out what happened to those 30 cars. Yeah, Don, I'm not asking for a stat or anything, but are you finding you're getting really good trades, or anybody on here on the board, are you, with your certified, are, are trades a little bit better because you've got that late model, tend to be a late model program car, so you're going to get, I know the average, what, the average age on, a, on the road now is 11 years, so it's tough to get any decent trades nowadays, but are you finding maybe CPO, anybody on here that, you know, that, that's a good 
aspect of the program too? I honestly don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, we find the I, higher cost I, of sale. I've really not broken that out. Yeah. I, the other thing I thought was interesting that we were talking about is uh, probably because of our pricing model, I've not ever broken out to whether we do better with the CPOV versus non. Mm -hmm. um, but we just do all the Chrysler products, so it's kind of hard to do the non. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Good question. <laughs> well, thanks. Thank now the you. Uh, again. <laughs> there we go. And they get something to take. Now, you know, the, we, I, I mentioned earlier, you know, taking a new car customer, switching them to CPO. Now, I think there is a challenge there, again, to try to hit the OEM numbers, but sometimes we're taking these CPO customers and switching them to new because of the programs, right? So is that a measurement or percentage of CPO sales leading from CPO um, to new? And this is asking it, taking that customer that bought CPO and then giving it to buying a new car. One, is that something that you track? Do you see that percentage? But also, again, I guess a twofold question, do you find that challenge? Are we taking some of our CPO customers that come in on CPO and pushing them to new to hit those incentives? And uh, Rod, I guess I asked you that. Well, there's no, there's no doubt we take our used car customers and stuff them in a new car because of the pressure the manufacturer puts on to sell new cars. Um, you know, you look at Chrysler dealers and what, how much money are you willing to lose to sell a Dart because that's the, that's the hot car. Um, what we find is a lot of guys that maybe don't chase the numbers so hard and, and choose to sell a used car make the same amount of money up in gross in their used car department uh, by not hitting the number from the factory. So it's all about gross. I mean, in the store, last time I checked, uh, we get paid on gross. Mm -hmm. Now, we only got a couple minutes left. I think we kind of covered number 10, which is measure your CPO's impact in the F&I office. I think. Uh, Don talked about the fact that he's able to get more percentage. Um, I, I don't know if the other ones want to chime in on that, if you've had better luck with your CPO and, and warranty penetration and gross on those. Seems like uh, across the board you guys are a little bit better on F&I with those. Um, and then so the, the, the other one would be be smart about reconditioning. I think we can hit on this for the last couple minutes here. If, uh, again, I'll throw this to you, David, because you have that wide variety. And then as the independent, because you have a little bit more flexibility maybe on your, your reconditioning, um, throw this question to you two. David, what do you guys do on reconditioning, um, you know, average costs, things like that with your, your CPO and how to eat that up? Well, it, it, it obviously varies by manufacturer from BMW all the way down to, to Kia, obviously. Uh, we have uh, everything except for Ford in terms of the major, major nameplates. So it's a wide variety. And I do think, um, you know, it, 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 it's important to understand when to certify and when not to. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the interesting thing for us is we pay full retail rates, the used car department does, on parts and labor. So reconditioning is, is, is a focus. And the irony is that very little difference, there's very little difference between a CPO vehicle and a 168 point inspected Hendrick vehicle. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is the only difference is the certification fee in most cases. So, yeah. and we wanna make the manufacturers happy. Uh, we wanna make it easy for our sales staff and we wanna sell quality and CPO does that. But in some markets for us, it makes sense to understand, do I need to compete with an independent that may not be certifying particular vehicles? Mm -hmm. Do I need to keep a portion of my inventory competitively priced so that I can go after that market? And that's one of the hardest things is to get people to understand when do you need to make that decision? What, would this, yeah. what is a price point car versus that, that, that quality car? I'm really, really getting that understanding about what to do. And Todd, before you answer real quick, uh, to add to that though, because Don, we talked about it earlier, you mentioned about a four day turnaround time, because that has a lot to do with the reconditioning, is that turnaround time. So David, before Todd answers, I mean, uh, how successful are you guys on that turnaround time CPO? Because you've got parts hold, you've got all these other things that can hold these cars up. Uh, would you guys track that and where are you running with that, uh, with that reconditioning turnaround time? We track that, we have some dealerships that, that can tell you down to the hour and so when I walk in and I understand that they're, that they're measuring down to the hour, I feel good about it because you're mm -hmm. going to get an honest answer about how long it takes. Sure. Those guys that measure and manage to that degree are getting cars out in three to four days, typically, like they're supposed to. And then I'll go into other of my dealerships where it's a guess, and mm -hmm. you know it's a guess. And so when you really start tracking it, and I can track it by when the photos are done, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, well, then why is it taking you 12 days to get your photos done? if you're getting the car retail, I mean, reconned and, and detailed sure. uh, in three or four, like you're saying. Yeah. So 
it really, you know, it, 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 it's an important thing. It's critical to turn. It's critical to velocity. Uh, and and, and getting, getting that done in a timely manner is going to make you sink or swim. So Good. Todd, how about you both the answer on the turnaround time on the certified, if it's any different, but then also reconditioning. Yeah. Well, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, really. Sure. Go ahead, Don. Yeah. I was going to, I thought you said Don. Oh. Um, sorry. Um, we run six days. Uh, the recon center I'm talking mm -hmm. about building, the target is four days okay. uh, because it is turning money. You know, one of the interesting things about uh, used car reconditioning in our store, that's $170,000 of gross profit in the service department almost every month. Um, they really got upset because we put somebody in the service department to approve other items on a car over and above, you know, a set of tires, you know, yeah. tune-up and, and an oil change. Um, so we actually put somebody in there so there was no delay. They were coming to my used car manager and asking him, should we do this, should we do that? Yeah. And that's a terrible waste of his time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I need him to buy cars and price them. That's his function, and that's where he's, uh, for us, uh, the best position. Good deal. And they were really upset that it cost them $7,000 a month to have another person in there. But, um, you know, for that gross profit, they can afford it. Uh, <laughs> it makes sense. It, it, is, uh, it is an interesting sidelight of this whole used car um, velocity thing is, mm -hmm. you know, because we do charge retail. And I plan on doing that. One of the interesting things is uh, you can use a, a gas station mechanic to recondition your car in the service department if you're doing a lot of rental cars. Because really, you, you maybe put a set of tires on it, you got a de tire department does that, you, you maybe turn it up and you, know, you definitely change the oil and you tighten up a few things and that car's gone. Mm -hmm. So our gross profit average on the labor is like 82% on the recon of those cars because that's not a $28 an hour tech, yeah, where our shop runs 71%. So yeah. um, just a sidelight of, uh, of used car reconditioning. Good point. I, I know we're running a little late, but I do want to hear from Todd on the independent side, again, kind of the flexibility you might have on reconditioning. What yeah. do you guys do with that? Uh, we have a high reconditioning standard to begin with. So we do 125 point inspection on all of our cars. We do 125 point inspection according to the NIADA CPO. There may be some minor differences uh, with respect to tires and brakes and so on. But I think what's most important for me, and I'm going to get on my soapbox for just one minute, yeah, go ahead. is, and I expected a little more confrontation in, up here, so <laughs> I, I applaud my, 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 uh, my panelists for not beating me up. but. Uh, you know, what the vision for uh, the NIADA CPO program really is to provide uh, the consumer with some confidence that they're buying a quality car. I mean, the spectrum, you guys are all selling relatively new cars, right? When you look at the spectrum of used car dealers, you've got a, a, a buy here, pay here dealers to, right, to, to you guys selling relatively new used cars. And there's such a wide variety of dealers, such a wide variety of vehicles that it would be really, you know, the vision is to establish some sort of quality benchmark that consumers can trust with respect to buying a used car, whether it is the buy here, pay here dealer or whether it's, the, whether it's, whether it's you guys certifying a non manufacturer vehicle. Um, so I can speak from a recon cost perspective, from my perspective, uh, it's not that big of a difference. But maybe from a buy here, pay here, or another independent dealer, uh, it would be a significant uh, difference. But I still think that, that being able to tag a car as an NIADA CPO car nationwide would give consumers, used car buyers, some confidence that they're getting a consistent product, which yeah. right now doesn't exist. So it, you know, it may be a very big vision, or you know, uh, but I, uh, I think it would prove to be because we don't have any standards. Used car dealers don't really have any, you know, notable standards. Every business has got some standards for yeah. for for their products. Used cars dealers really don't. How about your turnaround time, real quick? Is it 
uh, Todd, is your turnaround time? What's your average reconditioning turnaround time? It's not. I mean, just to put a set of tires on it, you know, no, matching. You run into two days, three days. What's oh, our recon process recon. takes it takes a while. Yeah. Uh, we got used cars, so you know we're trying to certify a car that maybe is 14 years old. It's going to take some time to get it through the shop, but uh, the cost isn't this any different. All right. That's it. Thank you guys uh, for your time. Uh, you guys are very insightful. Thanks for all your input on this. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you, gentlemen.